Now there is a load of hype around hex clad pans at the moment. They've been endorsed by Gordon Ramsay and they are just everywhere. Now they sent us a set of the pans under no obligation, but we thought we've got two chefs. Why not give them the pans and see if they're worth the hype? Straight away, we have to draw attention to the new man in the room. Yes, we couldn't let Ben test these pans by himself. We brought Kush, our head of food, in to help him. This could be a mistake. <laughs> this is going to get geeky, this is going to get chefy, but at the end of the day, it's only pans. It's only pans. Only pans. Only pans. Well, first off, unboxing, unpacking. They come with these to protect your pans, so that every time you finish with your pan and you wash it up and you dry it, you put it back in the bag so that it doesn't get damaged. Yeah, the, the concept sounds great. In reality, absolutely not. They're getting shoved in a cupboard. But it is quite important to think about how you do store your pans. You could just use a bit of kitchen paper between pans or pan pads. Yeah. What you shouldn't really do is just throw them all on top of each other. That's where you start to damage pans. Straight out of the box, they recommend you season the pan. So you traditionally season a pan that's got a high iron content, uh, cast iron. Yeah, or yeah, wok. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it protects the metal from rust, it stops water getting in, and it helps uh, make it non-stick after use. These pans are already non-stick, and they're made out of steel, but they still say to season it, so we have to season it. When you say season, do you mean just a little bit of salt pepper to finish? Uh, no, a tiny bit of neutral high temperature oil. We're using vegetable oil here. And you traditionally bring it up to a very high heat after rubbing onto the pan, let it almost bake on and set. Whereas here, what they're suggesting is a thin layer of vegetable oil and just heat it up slowly to a medium heat for a couple of minutes. It's a very light oiling and warming rather than what I would associate as a season that you might do on a wok that takes proper time. Yeah, like a good massage, light oiling and warming. <laughs> <laughs> really get it in as there. Opposed, as opposed to an inferno. <laughs> So right off the bat, let's talk about what the pans are. They are a hybrid pan of non-stick and stainless steel. Non-Teflon-based non-stick. I think it uses ceramic compound, which is the black. And then you can hear, it sounds a bit like grating, and that's the lightly raised stainless steel hexagonal dots. And I think that's where they get named from. In theory, this hexagonal design will give you very even heat distribution and heat retention. So our first dish, is a classic apple tart to tan, and we're gonna make caramel in it. So first up, the caramel, a dusting of caster sugar in the pan over a medium high heat, and then we're gonna prep some apples, peeled, quartered, cored. This is them living their best life. Well, the thing, the thing is, the two of them went to university together, didn't they? Yeah. And I think this is how they got to know each other, just standing there chopping and peeling onions. Peeling and, and yeah. Ben would peel an onion, then I'd have to re-peel it, because he'd missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Says he, you've missed some on the apple. Kush and I have very different cooking styles. Yeah, Kush is good. <laughs> <laughs> that sugar's taken a while to melt. That's probably because of our rubbish electric hobs. Do they also work on induction and gas? Yes. Okay. They say they work on any heat source and are oven safe. Hence why we're doing a tart tartan, because it has to go in the oven. It's not e heating too evenly at the moment. So they say never stir a caramel. Uh, that's not true. Oh. It is the best rule for normal home cooks. Yes. Because it eliminates risk. We can't have rules for normals and rules for chefs. Yes, we have to, you because have you to. guys don't listen to the detail. Yeah. So we have to give you something that's simple, top line, that does most of it. Oh, yeah. right, look, he's got Fact. a friend. He's, he's, suddenly, he's suddenly got a friend in the kitchen, yeah. and he gets all big and big for himself. Look, I've got someone here to protect me. We've dumbed it down for you, because you can't handle the truth. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so we're doing a dry caramel. See, there's no water, it's just sugar. A lot quicker. It is a bit riskier because you could burn it. It will crystallise if you stir it straight away. But once the caramel starts to form, you go in with the second half of the sugar and stir it together, and then you should get an even heat. It's working pretty well. We're going to take it a bit darker than we'd expect because then we're going to bring it back with the sweetness of apples and butter. Butter goes in, it foams up, then the apples, and then a puff pastry lid, which we've already cut to shape and put in the freezer so it is rigid and easy to work with. Is there anything better than the pride that you feel after you've cooked a meal for friends, family, or loved ones, and you see their little faces light up with joy as they tuck into your creation? Well, for many, knowing what to cook, how to make it, and what to buy can be daunting. So what if I told you, oh, so what if I told you that in the next 28 days, you could do something that could save you money, reduce your food waste, and change your cooking habits forever? But not only that, 
This February, if you cook up just one recipe pack from our Psychic app, that's only three meals, you will automatically be entered into a competition to win all of these incredible prizes and the ultimate sorted food filming experience. Yeah, you can join us here in the studio to see what goes on behind the scenes and have a very special lunch cooked for you by our head of food, Kush. All right? Mm. All right. That is the 28 day sidekick challenge. Sign up, enjoy great food, and good luck. We can't wait to see your creations. So we are gonna to return to our apple tart tan later, but dish number two, steak with like an umami steaky sauce. Mmm, umami. <laughs> Now these pans require you to slightly rethink the way that you cook because they don't like to be heated to super high temperatures, which is what traditionally you might do to sear a steak. A stainless steel pan that you can get fiercely hot that's got a really thick base is another approach. So the stainless steel is 50% of this. It's kind of the raised bit off the non-stick. Alternatively, you've got something like a non-stick pan, which you could cook steak in, but then you also don't want to preheat that too high. Start with hot oil in the pan till it's shimmering and looks loosened like it does now. Put the steak in, give it a few turns, and then once it's started to colour, put butter in, and then we start basting. So despite it only being a medium heat, we're still getting a good sear on it, because it has got lots of contact with stainless steel. Are there hexagonal lines on it? No. <laughs> there aren't? Okay. No, 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 no. So it's, it's not raised enough to, to... Yeah, okay. a good point. Like a cast iron, you might get grill lines. Yeah. You're, not, you're not etching into this. Are you happy with the sear? because they make some strong claims on their site. Not they, Gordon Ramsay. Oh, sorry. I personally think you'd have got a better sear in a full stainless steel pan. What I would say is because they're a hybrid, they're doing two things, and I'm not sure they're gonna do either of those things to 100%, Yeah. but by doing both of them to, I'm making up numbers, 80, 85%, plus adding the durability, they become an all-rounded good pan. Theoretically. Theoretically. <laughs> We're chefs, so we're sticking a temperature probe in the steak because we've spent 40 pounds on it, so why risk overcooking it? And essentially, once that hits 53 degrees inside, it's done. Now this is for our pan sauce, which we're going to pour over the steak as it continues to rest. It is mushrooms in that browned butter, followed by shallots and chilli and garlic, and then a whole bunch of umami. Absolute force of habit, this, which is why I always have a tea towel in the back pocket because you can always grab it and hold onto the hot pan handle because if you're cooking in cast iron, it will be freaking hot or stainless steel, but these aren't because they're hollow and they have this wide kind of A shape, which means that even though the pan is at good temperature and good searing and good basting, the handle isn't. Worth pointing out, metal utensils, absolutely fine. Don't stab it with a fork or with a skewer or anything that's gonna go into, they'll give it bits between the hexagonal rays. Uh, two seconds to clean the pan, and what's good is that you can basically clean it inside and out because the whole thing is non-stick. So, I'm quite happy with this way the steak turned out. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> oh, hello. Now, this is why I said this was two chefs. It's got a buttery sear. Oh my gosh. Obviously inside we've not got like a smoky char grill kind of vibe maybe hiding it under all this flavour, you get away with not the ultimate char from a cast iron pan. Well, I think that's all right. I mean, it's damn delicious. Mm. It's definitely a compromise, but it's produced a very good result. Should we do something different? So number three, potato cakes, and then sticky proteins like fish skin or halloumi. Mm. I've, had, I've had problems with all of these. So we're gonna make some bubble and squeak patties. Why is, why is Kush getting ready for another massage? <laughs> <laughs> So I want to oil my hands. Rather than having to fill a whole glass full of oil, you float the oil on top of the water, so when you pass through it, you get oily fingers. Don't look at us like that. <laughs> I love bubble and squeak, but it's made from leftover mashed potato, which has already had the milk and or butter in it. So when you do it, it can be a bit wet and sticky, and sometimes you can have problems in the pan. The key is get it in there and don't move it. Or cheat it and flour it, gives you a bit of a safety net, but we're hoping we don't need to. So, salmon, <laughs> boys, listen. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I've got a funny feeling in my trousers right <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, pan-fried salmon. Uh, we want a really crispy, crunchy skin, like salmon crackling. 
One fillet I cut into two, one I unwrapped and left uncovered in the fridge for two days, and one I didn't unwrap. The reason I've dried one piece out is to test whether the technique that we used to use in restaurants still works in these pans. Dry your skin out so it takes away all the risk of it sticking. It's the proteins in the food that bind to the pan, so you're kind of going to struggle to get away from that. It's why eggs and egg protein are some of the worst. They're not sticking so far, they're zhuzhing around in the pan. Time to flip. Oh. Ooh. Ah. Interesting. That's very interesting. It's a very large pan for our domestic electric hob, mm. and therefore it's only got heat on some of it. Would you say that this size pan is better for gas then? So you get more even heat going around it? That, or to be honest with you, user error, as in I was doing it like that. Halloumi, patted dry, and then into an oil pan. Simple maths, 80% of cooking before you flip it. Yeah, so we're gonna let the heat come up through the fish. You'll see it on the sides going opaque. Flip it and take it off the heat. Is, is one of those wobbling and the other's not? Yes, so gentle wiggle on the pan. One is flying around there, the dry one, and the other one is not moving at all. Oh, there you go. It needed a bit of help and now they're both moving. But that's quite evidential, isn't it? The tricky thing with this test is that nearly all the pans that I buy, no matter how cheap they are, they always work first time. Oh yeah, definitely. I agree, I think this will come down to, like any expensive bit of kit, how you look after it and its durability in the long term. So the fish is cooked, but you can see a marked difference in the colour. You've got a rich bronze, and you can hear that, on the dry fish. Sounds like pork crackling. So you'll have le less, less crispiness, less flavour, I think. So what we're learning is the pan works for both. If you want better crackling, dry your fish. Yes. But I feel like it's worked, just by looking. Hot all the way through and crisp on the outside. Quite delicate, so that wouldn't have worked, I don't mm. think, mm. In a, definitely not in a stainless steel pan. More difficult in a stainless steel for sure. Yeah. I mean, ironically, the tasting is almost irrelevant because the yeah. pan mm. doesn't change mm. the flavour of the food. You still have to think, because mm -hmm. that's not how I would typically have cooked those things. I'd have gone hotter and higher. Yeah. Whereas this, you've got the ability to go at a lower medium temperature for longer. I almost become accustomed now to losing the skin of the pan and yeah. being like, that's, just part of, that's part of the process. It's peeling off and sticking mm. to the pan. That to me is the most impressive of all of them. The yeah. fact that it didn't stick at all mm -hmm. straight away there, even with a wet skin. Yeah. If you have the time and you dry your skin out, you're going to get a better result. Right. I think it's my turn to make some horrible sounds in a pan. <laughs> a roux turned into a bechamel turned into a mornay for mac and cheese. <laughs> oh! Oh! We're making the roux and just putting in the butter in a few, two or three different intervals. That's milk. Putting in the other dairy liquid. Yeah, putting in the, the milk. I did the chef. In two or three intervals. Yeah. I still make a roux and a bechamel and a mornay with a wooden spoon, because if you do it right, it's lump-free anyway. I always use a whisk, metal in stainless steel, and yeah. then once it's come up and bound together, then I switch to a silicon spatula. Nice, thick, smooth. So we're going in with Comte, cheddar, parmesan, pecorino, and smoked provolone. I must say, I like the height of this pan. As you can see, the smaller pan is shallower, but this one's got a good depth to it, means, means you can you know, whisk and stir in it. It's not too shallow, so the sauce isn't gonna fall out of sides. So that's all tightened up nicely. Into the oven, 230, until it's bubbling and golden. Probably worth mentioning, we said the handles don't get hot earlier. We mean when on the hob. Obviously they get hot in the oven. That is a rather lovely mac and cheese, but the point of doing this was make a sauce, a roux, in a pan with a whisk, which you wouldn't normally do in a non-stick pan for sure. And then also, once we made the sauce and the pasta went in, it went into the oven. So again, hot oven, it's an oven proof, including the handle, but just make sure it doesn't get too hot. Also, there are some bits that have caramelised onto the pan and in an enamel dish or a baking tray, they'd be really hard to get off. But I think, yeah, nothing has stuck. I think it's going to be too hot to eat, Chef. For you, yeah. I've got a very soft, delicate tongue. <laughs> I know. <laughs> now stick to your rib cheesy goodness. Yeah. The crusty bits of the mac and cheese are the best bits. Exactly. That's why I love doing it in a mm. frying pan. Yeah. 
It's done everything we thought it would mm. after testing the other dishes. Mm -hmm. Dish five, a light crepe batter. And what we're testing is, do they stick? First pancake is always a snacking pancake. It's a write-off. It doesn't get served, it just gets snacked on. But why? Because of temperature equalization across the pan. So it's a thin pancake batter, one part flour, one part egg, two parts milk, and then we've laced it with brown butter. So you should get a nice coloring all over when you've got the pan up to temperature. First pancake, definitely no stickage. I like the hexagonal pancake shape. <laughs> Lovely. Classic. I don't know whether it's breakfast or dessert, but I'm happy either way. Ooh. It's a mini burrito. Yep. I, I just see how we're never invited. We're never invited. You don't like banana. Yeah, but I like pancakes. <laughs> do I have a pancake? Yeah, yeah, I do. Lacy, laminated with butter, golden hexagonal, it turns out. Um, Colouring, simple enough. And easy enough, because none of it's stuck, and it doesn't even need washing up. Yep. Beautiful pancakes, boys. Lovely batter. Yeah. Yes, we've only cooked four or five crepes in it, so it is still brand new, but they actually say these get better if you use them for a couple of weeks, because they kind of naturally season themselves. Why, by being more seasoned, is it better as a pan, then? You season food to get it ready to eat, you season the pan to get it ready to cook. Damn, that's actually really useful. Yeah. Uh, so this came out of the oven. Uh, it's cooled down for eh, about half an hour. If it spins, we'll know that nothing will stick to the pan. So hand on top and turn. Ooh. So that's saying that it should flip out quite easily. And typically you would, or perhaps need to, just heat the bottom of the pan to loosen it to flip it out. Yeah. Yeah. However, in this instance, we shouldn't need that. Yeah. Moment of truth. Hum. It's like you've done one or two of those before, Kush. Off. <laughs> Why do you chefs make this look so easy? And still it comes out with nothing stuck. There's a little bit of caramel on the edges, but I think that's to be expected. Soak that pan in a large bowl of warm, lightly soapy water, and then just wipe it out. That'll dissolve the sugar off. And they are also dishwasher proof. Cut a slice. Oh my goodness. Would you like some, boys? Oh, no! Oh, now no, we get an invite! Yeah. Ready? That's so good. That caramel. It's now at the right level of bitterness, isn't it? Mm. It doesn't taste too sweet for sugar. That's stonking. So the set we tested today came as part of a four pan set with three lids, but one of the pans was a wok, which we couldn't test today because we haven't got the facilities to. But what did the set come in at? So that set today is £420. OK. And as chefs, having tested it, what's your honest opinion of them? For me, there hasn't been true like innovation in pans for like 40 years since Nonstick came about. This is the combination, the hybrid of the two. And as long as you buy it, understanding what the pan does, and are prepared to adjust your cooking, then you get great results. And I'm struggling to fault them. There's no getting around. They are expensive pans, which is even more reason to make sure you look after them. So it feels to me like that new technology could be a game changer in pans. But every recipe as a normal that I'm going to go and read is going to tell me to turn the heat up to high to cook a steak. Yes. So I'm going to have to know what I'm doing and therefore know how to adjust to make the best of the pans and the best of a recipe. I'd suggest if you're going to spend the money and you already have some pans at home, maybe just buy one. Buy the medium frying pan, test it out, and if you do like that and you can adjust, then buy a set. You don't yeah, have to go okay. full hog straight away. It's interesting to think that over the next few years, as it's a new technology, that that starts to trickle down into more affordable, everyday pans. And Kush, great debut. Yes. Yes. Right, comment down below. What did you think of the pans? And Kush, let us know. <laughs>